And welcome to the third annual uh, Harold W. Sanu World Peace Lecture. Uh, we understand this is a busy evening on campus, so uh, some of you may need to leave before the end, and that's perfectly okay. I am Terry Smith. I'm a proud alumnus of the Central Methodist class of 1966, and I'm honored to introduce tonight's speaker. Before I do so, however, I want to pay personal tribute to Dr. Harold Sanu with whom I had great good fortune to study while attending here. My first class with Dr. Sanu was Far Eastern History and Politics. And I had been interested in the Korean War since I was five. My father was a combat engineer in Europe in World War II and during the Korean War in Austria, fortunately. So I had a keen interest in this war, even in my youth. So in Dr. Sanu's class, I wrote a paper about China's entry into the Korean War. Uh, I didn't keep the paper, but I'm sure it was brimming with fatuous nonsense. Uh, Dr. Sanu, evidently feeling charitable, gave it a B minus. And feeling more full of myself than usual, I went to him to complain about the low grade on my masterpiece. He patiently listed the errors in my narrative and the fallacies in my reasoning and the great stood. It was a humbling and sobering experience. So began my tutelage uh, with Dr. Sanu that day. I took every class he offered. When he asked me what my plans were after graduation, I said, I wasn't sure, but I was probably going to be a teacher. He said, why don't you get a PhD? And I said, what's a PhD? His answer put me on the path that has led to, well, tonight. He groomed me for graduate work, helped me get into Michigan State, and the rest, as they say, is history. I taught college, and then was a college administrator for many years, and I'm not teaching college full time again. I could not be happy. And I'm humbled by the profound <laughs> responsibility that a college teacher has, and I try to honor Dr. Sanu every time I walk into my classroom. A man of legendary generosity, kindness, and grace, he taught us political science and history, but perhaps more importantly, he taught us generosity, kindness, and grace. He also gave the world the sacred gift of his lifelong striving for peace with all his acts and words. My alma mater is fortunate that his family endowed the Harold W. Sanu World Peace Lecture so that each year we can hear the thoughts of a distinguished citizen on the subject of world peace. And we are fortunate to have such an individual here tonight. Glenn Bloomhorst, who grew up not far from here, and got his higher education down the road at the University of Missouri is President and CEO of the National Peace Corps Association. You can read about its mission in your program, as well as other highlights of his long and distinguished career in international service. My daughter Lindsay and her husband Tony served as Peace Corps volunteers in Armenia in 2001-2003. For them it was, as it is for all Peace Corps volunteers, a profoundly life-changing experience. They were honored to serve, and Lindsay still serves. She is president of the Columbia chapter of the Returned Peace Corps volunteers. Glenn, I told Lindsay that you were coming, and I'd get to meet you. And she said, Glenn's just a great guy. She said, howdy, and she said, she'll see you at breakfast Friday. My wife, Jane, is uh, also a member of the Central Class in 1966, and we have a son, uh, Michael, who is currently in a village in rural northern Nicaragua. He's not in the Peace Corps, but his work for a Fulbright scholarship is very much in that spirit. It runs in Smith blood. Glenn was an ag major at NU and was planning to return to his hometown to eventually run the local co-op but two professors at the university saw his potential and introduced him to the world of international development. It's a beautiful story 
often told about faculty, guides, and mentors. Ladies and gentlemen, with pleasure, Glenn Bloomhorst. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Good. I really appreciate that introduction. Very fitting, too, uh, that we would have a friend of the Peace Corps family uh, introducing me. Uh, and Lindsay's a good friend of mine down there in Columbia, head of the group of returned Peace Corps volunteers in central Missouri. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I appreciate such a great turnout. I'll just uh, uh, mind you that I won't be flattered because I know you do get bonus points for coming tonight, so it's, it's not that I'm a, a draw for you, but I also realize that we're competing here against apparently a basketball game later in the evening, so uh, I will uh, be as succinct as possible, uh, allow some time for Q&A and then some gathering afterwards, and, and look forward to uh, visiting with all of you. Um, I'd uh, like to mention also that this is probably the most nervous I've been before speaking uh, with a crowd because not such a huge crowd that it is, but because my parents are here <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my brother is here as well. And so uh, it's uh, something different when you're speaking and, and you know that uh, there's going to be everything is recorded and eventually it'll be sent probably to the National Archives and published in the Slater paper and Marshall Democrat News and everywhere else. Uh, but I do appreciate my press agents, mom and dad, and my brother for being here, who flew in from, uh, from Kansas City area on his plane, he says, to, to, to be a part of this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, and I know that, uh, I don't think uh, he is here, but the chairman of Board of Trustees of uh, Central, Methodist, or Central Methodist University, uh, Dr. Tad Perry. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Josh Jacobs, who's out there somewhere at, oh, in the back, um, and Megan uh, Fries, who, uh, helped coordinate and organize this from several months back, I believe, that we first uh, were in contact. Uh, all the effort that they put into having my uh, visit here uh, uh, be without a hitch at all, and uh, very uh, much uh, a joy to work with those individuals. Um, I'm really also grateful to the family of Dr. Harold Sunu. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading a little bit and understanding uh, about the legacy that he has left here in Fayette at CMU, and uh, really I'm just, uh, uh, impressed by how much of an impact that he's had on the university community here. And I commend the university for establishing, uh, first of all, for, for giving Dr. Sanu the opportunity to, to be at, at Central Methodist University. I understand that wasn't necessarily where he was headed uh, throughout his uh, life pathway, but eventually he found the doors open here and, uh, and found that this was an environment where he could build a program and uh, educate on issues that were very important to him, among those, of course, world peace. And so it's really an honor for me to be uh, here, invited as a, a, a part of this legacy, if you will, uh, to speak on behalf of um, the program about peace. And I, I read a little bit, you know, when I took this, uh, this opportunity and, and um, to understand that really what I'm going to share tonight, hopefully, will be to all of you, especially those of you who are students, just uh, an opportunity to, to, to hear what kind of ways are out there, or opportunities that exist for you to influence your world in such a positive way and hopefully bring about uh, a more peaceful world uh, through uh, greater cross-cultural understanding and friendship and, and interaction. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of an audible tonight. I, I presented my theme for the, the discussion this evening as uh, I believe it was Waging Peace, Our Social Responsibility. Uh, really what this is going to all be about is a service and how I believe in my life how service is the solution to many of the things that ail our world. Uh, and it is a way that we can also use the gifts that we've been given in our lives uh, to make a difference. And uh, it's, it's, it's not all about upward mobility or about uh, achieving prosperity or wealth or prestige. It really is about serving others and, and I hope that that is, is a message that resonates with you as well. Um, I wanted, wanted to start out by asking a, a bit of a survey here, too. Um, raise your hand if you have served in the armed forces. Got a couple of them down. Okay, thank you so much for your service. Uh, second, has anyone served as missionaries? That's me, too. Great. Has anyone served as a diplomat by chance? Not yet. Okay. And uh, anybody served in AmeriCorps, Vista, Teach for America, those programs? 
All right. Anybody served in the Peace Corps? Am I the only one here, really? That surprises me. Well, um, anyone who has a family member who served in the Peace Corps? Yeah, a few of us here. So this, uh, this will not be preaching to the choir, quite literally. I see we do have a few choir members up there, but this will be to a new audience for me because I normally am speaking to individuals who have served in some capacity as staff or volunteers in the Peace Corps. And uh, it's, it's something that is challenging sometimes because we all speak the same language and we all understand the same things. And, and what I'm going to try to do tonight is present something that, that is fresh for you in terms of our perspective on the Peace Corps. Let me give this a try here to make sure this works. Um, Dr. Schreiber is uh, the first Peace Corps director, and um, he had a lot of good things to say and think about peace and how to achieve world peace. And he himself, I think, was the epitome of service in terms of uh, how he lived his life and his uh, career. And of course, uh, many of you might know that he was the first Peace Corps director appointed by President Kennedy when Peace Corps was founded by President Kennedy's executive order back in 1961. Um, but I think the most important thing that he said about achieving world peace is that we need to come to understand each other better, that sometimes those divides between us aren't necessarily intended to be divides, they just simply are different understandings and different perspectives, and that if we can cross those boundaries and come to under understand each other better, we will live lives of friendship and peace in that. Okay, I, um, this was to prompt me to ask you who had served in the different branches of service. I apologize that we, we already went through that, but I wanted to, to also mention, um, I came from myself, a family of uh, service. Uh, my father here uh, was a Marine, I guess is a Marine, as they say. Uh, my brother served in the Army, and out of that he got a free ticket to the Persian Gulf one time. And uh, my uncle served in the Vietnam War. And I think others uh, earlier than them uh, also served in uh, world wars and other places. Uh, so we do come from a family of service um, by inclination. And so as I uh, was in my university career and start, starting to think about what I would do, I think service was in the back of my mind. And as Dr. Smith mentioned, it was some uh, university professors that, that actually uh, inclined me more towards service uh, and uh, encouraged me to join the Peace Corps eventually. So, um, I'm hitting the button here and it appears to be working. So I did go to the University of Missouri and I played rugby down there. I was FFA president and as I was uh, contemplating at that time, I'm going to go back down the road to Slater and I, hopefully I can get a job at the cooperative and work my way up to manager someday and that would be that and I would be happy with that. Um, but thanks to the intervention and the encouragement of some of my uh, college professors who said, have you heard about international development? Um, no, well here's what it's all about, and why don't you, by the way, try to find a way to go overseas and, and experience what's outside your country. So I took a mission trip with my wife at the time, and we went to Mexico, came back totally with our eyes opened and uh, eager to learn more about, um, about the world out there. And what started as this in my college years led to where I am right now. And I wouldn't necessarily guarantee that if you join the Peace Corps, you'll eventually stand next to the President of the United States. But it could happen, and in my case it did. And I've had the opportunity uh, to meet with uh, the previous administration, President Obama and his wife, a couple of times. And it's just been such a privilege to serve in this capacity representing the Peace Corps community to our government and to the, the President of the United States. Well, how did I get here then? Um, there's this Missourian by the name of Twain, and uh, he uh, had some encouragement that he wrote about as well. And if you haven't read Twain, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and one of the things that he encouraged was travel. And so I thought that sounded really good. Traveling sounds fun. I, want to, I think it, it's all about seeing the world and it's about um, in, in understanding and enjoying uh, other cultures and immersing ourselves in them. And so Twain was, was I think, a smart guy to, to suggest that we travel as much as we can because it could cure a lot of things that ailed us. But there was also a faith-based notion for me that I, I believe that I was blessed with many I had many gifts uh, and talents that I could use and uh, that I could use in helping others. And I believe that there was a calling to a ministry of sorts that I could, I could have and that would be uh, something that I could fulfill in overseas service. So granted, I could serve in the United States, at home, abroad, wherever, but in this case, I chose to serve uh, abroad. Um, but there was a, a man, um, John F. Kennedy, was really the one who put it, I think, the way that most of us understood it more clearly. It's, it's really not about us. 
It's about what we can do for our country. Um, not to expect from our country entitlements, not to expect things uh, for us, but in turn what we can do for our country. And so responding to the same call that, that brought my brother and my dad and others to military service, uh, that brought me to serve in, in, in the Peace Corps as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, it is, as we would say, a way of serving your country. When I introduce myself to members of Congress and to others, I am particular about saying I served my country in Guatemala from 1988 to 1991. And members of Congress and others who hear that say, that's right, you did. You, you, we recognize sometimes our military officials and others for their service in the armed forces, but we don't always recognize those of you who have served in, in other capacities as well, like AmeriCorps or Peace Corps. So that was my pathway, uh, was through the Peace Corps um, to uh, eventually get myself uh, down to Guatemala, uh, which uh, is where I served in the Peace Corps. And I'm still trying to click this and it's, it's just not doing it. So I wanted to ask uh, what maybe comes to your mind when you think about Guatemala. Anybody been to Guatemala by chance? A few of you, all right. Yes, Catherine, you came down to see me. Thank you so much. My parents came down to see me too. How about that? Um, so if we did a word cloud around what comes to mind when people think of Guatemala, there's some pretty interesting things that, that I think would come up uh, that we might think about, and uh, this might be it. Uh, this could also be fitting for Mexico or Colombia or Peru or, or a lot of places where our images of those places may be this. It, it may not necessarily be, um, uh, if you will, uh, uh, agradable things, how do you say that, uh, pleasurable things. Uh, it, it is things that maybe we feel are influencing our culture or our lives here in a negative way or that we have an image of, of these places. Well, the image that I have of Guatemala is not that. This is what, the, what I think of when I think of Guatemala. I think of uh, beautiful lakes and volcanoes, uh, beautiful landscapes in, in Guatemala. I think of the, the Mayan ruins of Tikal up in the northern part of the country in the Pedan. I think of Semana Santa, Holy Week in, in Guatemala, where the Catholic processions over the streets uh, paved with sawdust that's, that's multicolored. It's one of the most fascinating things that we've ever seen. Uh, the smell of incense and, and the, the music and everything about that is, is just wonderfully beautiful. I think about marimba music, which is something that I woke up to almost every day and went to bed to almost every night. There is always marimba somewhere playing in our community. Um, and when there were coups, coup d'etats, which happened, I think, about three or four times, marimbas also played on the radio. So we always knew that was, was going on when we heard, when we heard of marimba on, on the radio. But nonetheless, these were the sights and sounds and smells that, that I think of when I think of Guatemala, and I think the people who've been there and, and visited uh, would think of also. And in particular, I think about the people. I think about the kids in particular that touched my life and changed my life while I was there because it was mostly kids uh, that, that were a part of my life there as a Peace Corps volunteer. Granted, I worked with farmers, and my wife worked with uh, the nurses and doctors and the health clinic, uh, but it really was kids that, that really enlightened our life down there. And these are some of the people that actually were a part of my life there. The before on, on the left is uh, from years ago when I served there, some individuals uh, that I worked with, actually, and then on the right when I went back to see them about uh, six months ago in March when I was in Guatemala for the last time. So these are lifelong friends, and I know that I can pick up my cell phone right now and, and get on Facebook or WhatsApp, and I can talk to Magnolia or Felisa or any one of these individuals now through the miracle of technology, and I have friendships there as close to the any friendships that I have here in the United States. Um, this was me, yes. <laughs> a few pounds lighter, a little bit more hair, and my wife Kathy, and uh, this is uh, what we uh, looked like in the Peace Corps back then. We've changed a little bit since then. Um, but we had what we considered just a really great opportunity to work on projects. This was our house. Uh, we lived in a little adobe house um, on the corner where the buses passed by every day. It was a, a brick street um, and a very comfortable place to live in. As you can see, it was multi-dimensional. We had a library, a, a dining room, a kitchen, and a, a living room all there in one. Uh, so we were very fortunate with that. And on the other side, we had a pila to wash our dishes and hands and a little shower off to the right and a bedroom back on the right uh, with a dirt floor. Uh, but it was totally adequate for us and we were able to live there and live on roughly $200 a day as our allowance, uh, eating the market, ride the chicken buses and, and walk or bicycle most of the places that we went to otherwise. Uh, so it was everything we needed. And what we saw was what we, was the family behind us. Um, this is the family that we live 
almost immediately behind us. Uh, my parents remember them very well. A family of eight that lived in this little cane hut right there behind us um, and were pretty much family to us because of the proximity more than anything. And we knew them all by name, we knew their ages, their, what was going on. We pretty much knew what was going on in their house at any given time as well too because we could hear everything out of their house as well. Um, one thing we noticed is that Martha and her friends would always come out every afternoon after, after uh, going down and touching water or whatever, and they'd just start by playing and singing and being happy. And, and we're, you know, it's, it's, it's such an impression that it can make on you when you see a family living like this that has virtually nothing, yet they are rejoicing and they're happy and they are, they are contented in what they do have. Uh, in some ways, and I would not say that they're living happily because they've lost members of their family, they, they, they deal with illnesses and sicknesses, they can't do so many other things that we do as, 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 uh, as Americans in particular, but they, they live in that existence and they can find happiness somehow in that. Um, our house was filled with kids in particular and with, with others that we uh, surrounded ourselves with, uh, family, friends, and kids in particular. But this is what we think of when we think about Guatemala and the work that we did there, myself in agriculture, where I learned to plow with a single plow, uh, pulled by oxen, and to plant fruit trees and, and other things. And we hiked a lot and, and really just uh, lived in this community and became immersed in it completely and became part of the community itself. So, um, it had an impact on us. So I think uh, Dr. Smith said, you know, it's a life transforming experience, which is exactly it. Every single returned Peace Corps volunteer, as we say, would say it impacted my life so dramatically. It transformed my life. It was the most transforming aspect of my life ever. And this is from people who are in their 70s and 80s, and they say this is the most important thing that I ever chose to do and the most impactful thing that I've done. So there are some statistics as well that returned Peace Corps volunteers would say about the impact on themselves and the impact on their communities. And I don't know if that's big enough to see up there, but the most important thing is that um, they definitely recommend this experience to, their, to others. They feel often that they got as much out of it as they got from it, that, that they did. They say that it is the most life-transforming part of what they've done in their lives and careers, and that it influenced their careers itself. And they, as a result, became more altruistic, more giving, more charitable. Um, in their lives and careers after that as they returned back to the United States. Um, I want to insert a, a, an anecdote here as well. Um, this is a picture of my parents. They don't know that I didn't know I was going to do this, but I did mention that they did come down and visit uh, when I was in Guatemala, when we were in Guatemala as Peace Corps volunteers, and a couple other people from my church and other places visited as well. Um, as they look back on it now, and as they would tell me, and I've heard them tell others, they say this was the most life-transforming um, experience of their lifetimes as well. That it was a shock of sorts. So for the week or ten days that they were in Guatemala, I made them ride the chicken bus and sleep on the floor and eat in the market and hike up to the villages and go down and plow with the plow and do everything that we were doing and visit with the neighbors. I think we even went in their house and sat around their, their fire there where they were cooking their meals. And it was, as could be expected, a dramatic shock to them. And uh, they came back to the United States after that brief visit down to Guatemala. And I know that they're avid readers and they're avid learners. And though they had not necessarily been immersed in another culture and another world like this before, they took it upon themselves to read. Uh, a tremendous amount of reading and understanding of what's going on in Latin America and Guatemala and around the world. And as a result of that, long story short, uh, they became themselves converted, if you will, to peace activists and have been leaders in the community here in Missouri and around, around the country really in many ways in what has been uh, uh, leadership for peace and, and for peace in our world. And so much that while, while I was serving in the Peace Corps and my, my brother was getting deployed to uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, uh, I, my dad, I heard from mom, he's on a bus. He's headed to Washington to protest the war or the next war or something coming up here. And next thing I know, she said, well, he's, he's in Iraq. <laughs> and sure enough, my dad was in Iraq uh, to show solidarity to the Iraqi people at a time which was very challenging for them in terms of, of what was going on in that part of the world. Uh, a little bit later, mom and dad, well, they're down in Cuba for this, this particular issue or that issue. And well, they're up in uh, Washington again, uh, protesting uh, this, uh, this challenge or that challenge. And, and, uh, uh, um, uh, trying to influence our members of Congress by writing to them and influencing the, the presidents and the presidential candidates by getting onto their platform and influencing them. So I, I just want to say that it's not just returned Peace Corps volunteers 
who have this experience and that can bring it back home and share that here and have an impact. I'm really proud of the fact that my parents and my brother and my sister also who visited and Catherine and others from my church, I know that they came back and they shared that story and they shared what they saw and that helped create greater awareness and greater friendship here in the United States for the Guatemalan people that we live with. Uh, so much that I know that they probably continue to say that they have such a memorable experience from that. So it can, it can impact you in, in even a short amount of time. Um, somebody else here had something to say about service, and uh, this is uh, a way I think that Martin Luther King put it in terms of why we could choose to serve. Um, and again, the point here is that we don't have to be special to be able to serve, and we can achieve greatness by service in itself. And if we look to serve others and humble ourselves in that position, that, that quite frankly, we will achieve probably much more than we can by trying to assume greater power, greater prestige, or greater, greater things, if you will, in life. Uh, and it's generated by love, love for others. And so I think these are very, very wise words uh, from Dr. Martin Luther King. A little bit about the Peace Corps, and I want to dive in uh, to some topics here related to Peace Corps specifically. I think I would say, and my recommendation to you is that if you are a student and you want to, to impact the world and you want to promote peace, um, of course I'm biased, but I will be definitely advocating for Peace Corps. And I, I believe there are great ways to serve, a variety of different places in the public and private sector for you to serve and to, 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 to use your gifts and talents around the world. But I will obviously very much promote the Peace Corps as an experience itself. Uh, Peace Corps has three goals uh, in support of its mission of greater understanding and peace and friendship. One is to provide technical expertise or technical support to countries that request it. So the countries where we serve have requested Peace Corps volunteers. We also uh, help them understand more about Americans by being there and explaining to them. Uh, an anecdote for that, for example, is I was in Guatemala in March, and, and as soon as I saw some of these old friends, um, the big hug, Glenn, it's good to see you, how are you doing? Why do Americans hate us? It was almost the second thing out of their mouths this, this, this spring when I went back there. And I had to start saying, Americans don't hate you, we don't hate you. There's, there's you know, some policies and perspectives and things going on right now that may give you that perception, but we simply don't hate you. Uh, you know, uh, Americans in general love other, other people and others from other countries. But there's this perception that needed correcting. And if Peace Corps volunteers were serving there in that area where I serve now, they would know that. But there are no Peace Corps volunteers there where I serve. So they have this misperception, again, about Americans and, and what's going on here in the United States with the proposals and policies that are floating about and wondering what's, what's going on. Why does America hate them? Why are they sending them all back to Guatemala? Why do they not want them there? What's, you know, what, what are the issues? And then we, we volunteers bring the world back home. If we come back with a greater understanding of other countries, and we do what we call the third goal work, which is helping create greater understanding here on the part of Americans and other, other peoples around the world. Um, what specifically do volunteers do? Well, these are kind of the six sectors that the volunteers work in. Um, again, education, health, community, economic empowerment, uh, and then three other areas which are um, environment, youth in development, and agriculture. And I served myself in agriculture, and my wife served in, in health. Uh, we're, usually, we're usually partnered with a local uh, agency or NGO or organization that you can work with in partnership. You're not on your own necessarily. You're supporting a national strategy for one of those areas uh, that the government has requested of the United States government to have support in. And this is what Peace Corps looks like today. There's roughly 7,200 volunteers serving right now in about 62 countries. Um, over the years, we've had over 225,000 individuals serve in the Peace Corps as volunteers in 141 countries to date. So that's what the Peace Corps is today. But here's what's happening uh, with Peace Corps. Um, and here's what our concern is at this moment. Uh, for those, if we have 7,200 positions in the Peace Corps uh, now, uh, this year, that means there's 3,600 intakes, meaning 3,600 individuals will be invited to serve overseas in the Peace Corps to fill those, those positions that every two years are, are ending because they're two-year positions, uh, so it's 3,600 positions per year. What's happened in the last few years, the, the application number has gone up tremendously. So there's 24,000 to 25,000 applicants each year. Uh, what that means is easily 5,000, probably closer to 10,000 or more qualified applicants are being turned away from serving their country in the Peace Corps. 
And nobody gets turned away from military service, but here we are turning away individuals like you from serving in the Peace Corps if that's what you choose to do. If you're a student and you're out there and all of you apply for the Peace Corps, chances are only a little handful of you are going to get in, even though all of you are well qualified. And as General Stanley McChrystal says, this is a tremendous waste um, when we have so many individuals that want to serve our country and just simply don't allocate the funding to make it a priority for them to serve. The other side of that is in other countries, uh, they are requesting more and more Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, so the demand factor is there as well as the supply, if you will, of volunteers. And I had the pleasure of, of being with the ambassador from Kosovo in a meeting, a series of meetings actually on Capitol Hill earlier this year. And her message was this. She said, well, we've only got 62 volunteers. And you know, this is really not even a serious program until the U.S. government invests more in our program here in Kosovo. And she gave a great reason why. She said, I want 1,000 volunteers or more. We can put them everywhere in the country. And she said, really what's so important about this is because what we get is the propaganda from Russia about you. And if that's all we're hearing about from Russia, that's what we understand about America. And that creates tremendous misperceptions among our people and among even our government and our, other, and our officials. So she said, we need more peaceful volunteers so that there's greater interchange and understanding between our countries and building the friendship that we have here and a lasting friendship on that. So there is a demand and a supply requirement there, but the problem is that, um, that there's just simply not the funding for it. Um, I, I carved out a few ways to think about how Peace Corps and uh, foreign assistance in itself uh, contribute to the U.S. economy. Uh, the work of Peace Corps volunteers at the ground level, in the trenches, on the front lines, if you will, in many, many cases, contributes very much to what is called our development programs uh, in the U.S. Uh, foreign assistance programs. Um, and it actually helps contribute to these, these sort of things in terms of uh, jobs and, and the economy. Um, it also helps uh, us to influence with others the values of democracy and the, 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 the principles that we believe in here in the United States, so much that many leaders around the, the world will attribute their experience uh, to, to Peace Corps volunteers, uh, to where they are now. Um, the president of Liberia, uh, Ellen Sir, Sir Leaf Johnson, uh, was taught by Peace Corps volunteers when she was young. Uh, and she says that was a life influencing experience for her. Um, Saran Pitswan, taught by Peace Corps volunteers in Thailand as well. And then uh, uh, 10, at least 10 heads of state from Africa have said, I was taught by Peace Corps volunteers. And that's what put me on this career pathway toward being president of my country. And just all seriousness aside, every single taxi driver in Washington, D.C., if you go to Washington, D.C., is an Ethiopian. And every time you say Peace Corps, they will say, yeah, I was taught by Peace Corps volunteers before I came here to the United States. Uh, I grew up being taught by Peace Corps volunteers. Um, but there's also an influence on us as, as volunteers. Uh, there are several individuals that uh, influence our lives today, whether it be by watching Netflix or, or uh, if you're pointing a telescope tonight at the International Space Station, you're looking at a returned Peace Corps volunteer up there, Joe Acaba, serving in, in NASA. Um, and other individuals around our country who have been leaders in public and private sectors that have influenced our lives in many ways. Um, I wanted to run quickly through some myths and uh, truths about um, foreign aid and foreign assistance. And we kind of lump all these things together, the State Department, the USAID programs, and the Peace Corps, because this is part of what we, is kind of a one budget account in the budget. Uh, one is that it doesn't work. And it's simply, quite frankly, does work. And in fact, Peace Corps volunteers have been instrumental themselves alone, not to mention our other development programs, in bringing about an end of polio in, in many countries of the world, in, in particular in Africa, in stomping out malaria, as we would say in West Africa in, in, in particular. They have been instrumental in, in vital, revitalizing the poultry industry in India, and, and on and on, the, the, the honey production industry in Latin America. Many of these things have been as a result of Peace Corps volunteers serving. So, uh, development assistance and Peace Corps service in, in terms of contributing to those development goals does work. Um, we also say that sometimes, well, it's too much of our federal budget. I mean, it's got to be at least 25%. Well, the fact is, it's not. Um, if, if we ask for a raise of hands here, I would bet mostly we would say it's probably 10 to 20% of our budget. Guess what? It's only 1% of our federal budget. The assistance that we provide through State Department, USAID, Peace Corps, and a lot of other those programs, Fulbright included, is less than 1% of our budget. That's the 150 account, international affairs. And within that, Peace Corps is only 1% of that 1%. So 
So if you imagine, it's a very small drop of funding that's, that's actually put into Peace Corps programs. We, we tend to joke about it being equivalent to the, the budget of the, of the uh, Navy marching band, or the Marine Corps marching band, or the, the left wing of a B-1 bomber. Uh, quite frankly, it is a rounding error in the federal budget, if you will. The other part of this is that uh, taxpayers don't want to put money into foreign aid. That's a myth. Uh, the fact is that uh, our taxpayers generally support a high degree, 70% and above almost every survey that's ever been conducted, of, of being generous in our foreign assistance to other countries. Um, so there is a support in our, in our economy and in our, um, in, our, in our society for supporting other countries with our uh, foreign assistance programs. Uh, the other myth that we see from time to time is that this, 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 this detracts from helping other individuals here at home. And the fact is, many of these is issues that, that are dealt with overseas, like Ebola or Zika or polio and others, um, could easily find their way to the United States. And if we're dealing with them on the ground where they are and can be eradicated and they're endemic, then we can have a greater impact in securing the lives of individuals here in the U.S. as well. Another one is that the foreign assistance it just goes to corrupt governments, and, and that's simply not the case. I, I know this personally because I worked on USAID programs for 25 years. Um, Ten of those years I was based in, in Bolivia, uh, in which I managed close to over $100 million worth of our U.S. foreign assistance programs there. I know that those resources were invested in the community to make an impact. I know that it was all driven by those communities because that's the way the programs were designed. I know there were no corrupt governments, no, no officials pocketing that money. I know that it was done well and it was done sustainably in the way that it should be. Now, that might have been in some part due to the fact that I, I felt very strongly about how our U.S. taxpayer money should be stewarded and, and, and cared for and invested in these countries and in these communities. But at the same point is, generally speaking, our programs are very effective and very, very cost effective and very efficient and the, the resources go to where it's most needed. There's always room, room for improvement, always room for reforms. There's some waste in some countries and some programs and some sectors, but the fact is this is a very cost-effective way of building friendship and peace. Uh, the other one is that this takes away from our military budget, and that's simply not the case. Our military budget is sufficient in itself. It, it quite frankly, uh, it lends itself to building the military budget because most of our leadership on the military side and in the development side and the diplomacy side say, if we're going to increase anything, we need to increase them all. If we're going to decrease, it's got to be decreased, and, and in particular on the defense spending. So there's a general consensus there that what's good for one is good for the other. Uh, again, that it creates dependency, which is just not the case. We are seeing programs developed and, and designed in a ways that build the independence of these countries so much that many of these countries could go on to become trade partners to the United States and uh, in essence uh, supporting other countries, like Korea is one in which uh, Peace Corps and foreign assistance programs help build a thriving economy there, and now they have their own volunteer programs and their own aid and assistance programs. Um, and that other countries don't do their part, well, this is just not the case either. And in fact, a, more, a lot of countries do more than the United States does itself in terms of foreign assistance, and I'll be showing you a little bit of that later. Here's what our federal budget looks like. So if you can find in there somewhere international affairs, that's that 1% I told you about, and within that slice is where Peace Corps lies. Uh, so you can see, and I'm not stating an opinion here in terms of how we allocate our federal budget, just showing it to you so you can, you can think about it, uh, but this is the way that it plays out, and where we spend our, your taxpayer money, if you will. Um, this is how our uh, assistance to other countries, uh, or excuse me, our defense spending compares to these other countries. So it's quite a bit, I guess we would say. Uh, it's probably, uh, looks like more than enough. Uh, compared to other countries, it's quite a bit more than what they're spending as well. Um, this is how our aid programs look in comparison to others. Now, in, in absolute value, the United States gives more than other countries. Uh, that is true. But as a percentage of gross national product, gross domestic product, this is the percentage of our giving. That means because we're a wealthier, wealthier country, we should, in essence, give more, right? But the fact is that we give much less than these other countries do. So there's something a little bit out of skew here in terms of how we have our priorities in terms of our, our generosity, our charitability to other countries, and our, our spending on defense and other areas. This is what's happened to the international affairs budget uh, over the last several years. Um, and this particular year and next fiscal year look to be even uh, more significant downward trends. 
on the international affairs being one, uh, what is called the base funding, is funding that includes Peace Corps. OCO is called Overseas Contingency Operations, and that can actually be defense spending in itself. So as you can see, that is getting bigger, and the funding for the base uh, programs, of assistance programs, is actually getting smaller. So this is going to serve for us. Just a little bit of a footnote here about deployment. Uh, the, the, the most recent uh, uh, assessments of, of military spending indicate that it costs for over $2 million to put a soldier in Afghanistan for a year. Guess what it costs to put a volunteer in the field? $55,000 roughly, okay? And we've got those folks in about uh, 62 countries right now. So it's a, a, quite a bit difference of a cost there as well in terms of the investment in a volunteer, investment in military or defense spending. Again, I'm not making an argument one way or another here, but it's just simply the fact that this is where we're putting our priorities. Uh, this is a transitional slide because I wasn't quite sure how to, how to move into this next thing, but what do we do about this? Um, well, you can do what you want. If this, if this works for you, that's fine. If you believe that that's what we need to be spending our taxpayer money on, that's fine. I personally don't. Uh, when I'm looking at securing the future of the Peace Corps and seeing that it's threatened in terms of its budget, which is happening this year, uh, we're going to do something about it. So we're going to mobilize our community to get them out there. Um, many of you might know, uh, recognize Senator Blunt there. Um, so one thing we do is we pay Senator Blunt a visit. Senator Blunt is on a key appropriations committee for the budget, including the Senate uh, state foreign operations budgets. So uh, we need to make him a friend of the Peace Corps, and not only a friend, but a champion of the Peace Corps. So if you care about the Peace Corps, even if you haven't served in the Peace Corps, make this guy your number one uh, person to tell about how valuable it is to us, right? Um, he is uh, your senator. He is to be responsive to you and his, as, your, as constituents. So make sure you tell him how you feel. Uh, we spend a lot of time up on the Hill as well. Uh, we talk to folks about the value of the Peace Corps. Many times we'll bring our host country national, like this individual here, who is a leader in the Kenyan uh, country, and they tell them, they tell members of Congress about the value of the Peace Corps as well. Um, we also spend time with return volunteers up there uh, in the districts around the country and on the Hill with a variety of different visitors, ambassadors, military personnel, and others to talk about the value of the Peace Corps. And yeah, it starts out with a conversation at the White House. Uh, not necessarily this way. I, I, this is one of the meetings that I had with the President and his staff and the Peace Corps Director and others. But we do make a pitch there to the President and, the, and to the OMB, the Office of Management Budget, budget, management budget and we tell them what we believe the Peace Corps' funding should be in the scheme of things. So uh, it requires a, a lot of effort to get out there and make sure they know that constituents care about the budget. Um, here's one of our strongest advocates. This is uh, Carl Eikenberry, was Lieutenant General in the Army. He, he, um, uh, he oversaw uh, the, the uh, U.S. Armed Forces in Afghanistan for several years under the Bush administration, and then was appointed um, ambassador to Afghanistan shortly after that. Um, and Carl Ackenberry tells a story of uh, uh, how he uh, was uh, out one day visiting uh, uh, with troops, uh, and they were going into a village where um, maybe a week or so earlier, the U.S. Marines there had suffered uh, casualties, several people had died. Um, they were going back in uh, to visit and to, to talk with the village elders and, and kind of learn what had happened and, and try to make, uh, make uh, agreements and, and build some understanding there. And so the ambassador, uh, as he would, made a trip out to this community. And as they approached this village in their, in their group, he said, uh, yeah, a man came running out. And of course, they're all on alert. You know, what's going on here? Is this a dangerous situation for us? But the man came out and, you know, very friendly. And he, he said, no, no, no. He said, I'm, I'm looking for Rick. So I want to see Rick. Is Rick here? Rick, Rick. I want to see Rick with, with you. And uh, they're asking amongst themselves, who's Rick? We don't know who Rick is. Do we have a Rick in this contingent? No, we don't. Was there a Rick in that uh, Marine deployment that came over here and was, uh, was, was ambushed? No, there was not a Rick. Well, who's Rick? Who is this guy, Rick? So the interpreter probed around and asked this, this, this man from this village, well, we just don't understand who you're asking. And I said, no, Rick, Rick, the Peace Corps. Peace Corps Rick. And he said, the guy who came here 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and helped us build our water system here. And, and so now that we've had water, and we've been a productive, productive community here for all these years, thanks to Rick, because he was here and he cared about us. And he has all these friends here. We call this Little America here because of Rick, because he came and shared his life with us. Carl Eikenberry, Ambassador Eikenberry, was so impressed by that, he said, I'm converted. He said, I, I really, truly believe now in the value of Peace Corps in particular, because I saw what it did here 40 years ago in Afghanistan. And not only that, he said, I saw that this village remembers a Peace Corps volunteer who served here 40 years ago, 
and made a little impact in their lives, he said, but none of them are going to remember the four Marines who died here last week. And he said, we need to have this type of soft power, this type of diplomacy and development as part of what we do as a national security initiative. So Rick, excuse me, Rick, Carl Eikenberry, Ambassador Eikenberry, comes to the Hill with us once, once a year in March. He goes up there with us and sits down with members of Congress and tells them why Peace Corps matters and why we need to have more of it. So I, I close here with just a couple of asks for you. I want to just give you a call to action, particularly you as students. Uh, the rest of you are off the hook because I think you've probably done most of this. Uh, but one is I would just say open your minds and be, and be open to learning more things. Take classes that you may not otherwise take. Read books that you might not otherwise read. And these, these are not necessarily the ones that I would recommend, but there's some good books up there that you should probably consider reading. Uh, watch the Vietnam documentary. If you have not, please do. There's a lot to learn just in that documentary. You can sit and watch it where in your living room. Any of these books are relatively easy reads, but they're really important stories and, and testimonies in there about our foreign policy, about our development programs, and about a variety of different things that, that would help you understand better what we're doing. I just simply am asking you to think outside your box a little bit and, um, and give it a chance. Take a mission trip if you want. I would really encourage any of you who have not been outside the country, if you don't have a passport, get one and take a trip somewhere. Study abroad for a week, a month, two months, to six months, whatever it might be. Get outside the country, not to Spain, not to Portugal, not to France. Go to Guatemala or Mexico or go to Thailand or somewhere. If you want to go somewhere and you don't have any way to go there, National Peace Corps Association has a travel program called Next Step Travel. And we also have a program component called Taste of the Peace Corps. If you want to go get a taste of the Peace Corps, you want to go visit the Peace Corps volunteers working in Guatemala, you can do it with our program. You can go down there for a week or two, spend some time with Peace Corps volunteers, see if you like it or not. If it makes you desire to join the Peace Corps, all the better. If not, that's fine too. Just get out and see the world, if you would, please. Um, again, some, some uh, Twain uh, encouragement from us here. Uh, I think Mark Twain, having come from Missouri, speaks uh, from a, a great amount of authority there in terms of what, uh, what we should do in terms of uh, getting outside our box, getting outside of our frame of mind and seeing the world and, uh, and doing the things that we feel called to do in our life, wherever it is to serve and whatever it is that we do. Uh, I want to, my penultimate comment here comes from Sergeant Shriver again, uh, from uh, uh, his time at the Peace Corps when he, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Peace Corps. Uh, Sergeant Shriver uh, said this, and uh, it's, it's worth something I think that we can all take to heart. Serve your wives, serve your brothers, husbands, serve your families, serve your neighbors, serve your cities, serve the poor, join others who serve. Serve, 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 that's the challenge, for in the end it will be the servants who save us all. I think those are profound words for us to think about. And so my call to you is to serve in any way that you can. Here on campus, here in your community, abroad, wherever it might be, just take the opportunity to serve in some way. Um, and I'll end with just a reflection back here on Dr. Sunu. As I read about his background, he, he faced discrimination here in the United States. Uh, having come from Korea, shortly, uh, I think after uh, the U.S. was involved in the Korean War, there was you know, there's the different tensions and difficulties to deal with there. He eventually uh, was unable to find work uh, in his academic area here, or the way that where he wanted to work. He, he went to Europe, eventually came back and found his way here to CMU, um, and established a tremendous program here. And as a part of that, his legacy is remembered in this way, and the information that I was reading about him, it's that believe, he believed, Dr. Sanu believed, that people have minds that can think and therefore should be used fully and critically in that capacity. So I just ask you to think about everything you've heard tonight, uh, let it absorb, and then go act, practice, be involved, be engaged. And I hope it's been an inspiration of some sorts to you, and I look forward to any questions uh, that you might have for me. I appreciate your attention. Thank you.